Matthew chapter 26, verse number 36. When you have that, say amen. amen. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and, they began to, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with the sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. And he asked this question, Could you not watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you'll not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And he goes on to say, He went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away from me, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And then he came back and he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and he prayed a third time saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. We thank you for what we've already been a part of this morning as we see this family go through the baptismal waters together. God, we realize their journey is just beginning as they've placed their faith and trust in you. Now it's time to learn and to grow and to become the people that you've asked all of us in this room to be. This morning, an important question for all of us is what are we putting all things that we know that we need to be doing for you? And if we are, we pray, Father, this morning that you'll speak to our hearts that today we'll determine to put you first and not to delay any longer the things that you're asking us to do. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. I want to talk for just a minute about what these disciples did. And what we do a lot of times is, is a big word, but when I tell you what it is, you're going, you're going to exactly know because some of you are doing it right now. There's things at the house that, that uh, fits this place for you. There's things at work that fits this for you. There's things in your personal life that will fit this for you. Big word called procrastination. Putting off until tomorrow the things you could be doing Today. How many of you all, when you got up this morning, you saw stuff that needed to be done around the house, or, or, or you know some stuff that, that, that you need to get taken care of, and you thought, man, you know what, it's raining outside, and, and I'll just do it till next week sometime. And this is exactly what, what sometimes we do. We keep delaying doing things. Why do you keep delaying contact with somebody that you, know, you, that you need to contact? Why do, you, why do you keep ignoring a list of phone calls maybe that, that you need to make? What's keeping you from witnessing? Or maybe even this morning, what's keeping you from getting saved? But here's what happened to the disciples. They thought that they had all the time in the world to hang with Jesus. He'd been here now for about three or three and a half years, and so they had just gotten used that Jesus was always going to be there. And so... You know, it was no big deal when he took them to the garden and said, pray with me. After all, they were tired. They didn't have any recollection that the reality was is that Jesus was getting ready to, to go through some really bad stuff and eventually leave the earth until he comes back the second time. And so their window of opportunity was closing, but they didn't understand that. And so here the disciples, when Jesus, think about how privileged these guys were to be able to go with Jesus, just them three, go with Jesus and spend some time with him in prayer. Let me ask you a question this morning. Would you come to the altar and kneel a knee for an hour if Jesus was here and ask you to come to the altar and pray with him? 
Or would you find a reason not to? Your back's bad, your hips are bad, your knees been replaced, your your hairs, you're having a bad hair day, whatever it might be. See, this is what they done. You know, they had the opportunity to go. Je look, Jesus didn't invite all the twelve. He just invited these three. And he takes them to a place in an intimate moment with him that he really needs uh, his disciples, his friends, his brothers to back him up. He really needs somebody to be there for him. And so he says, come and go with me. And when they come and go with him, they fall asleep. So he goes and prays and he comes back and he says, what are y'all doing? What are you doing? Don't you realize what's getting ready to happen? But I'm sure the conversation was, but Jesus, we're tired. Man, we're tired. We've worked all day. We've traveled all day. We, we've just, we're just tired, Lord. Ate a ham sandwich. No, they didn't eat ham sandwiches. They were, no, they wouldn't have ate that. We ate a bologna sandwich. <laughs> Out of all the, all the illustrations I could use, why, did, why would I use a ham sandwich for Jewish people? <laughs> we ate a turkey sandwich, Jesus, and we're tired. <laughs> And, and some of us are that way. Lord, I'd go to church, but I'm tired. I stayed up too late last night watching the ball game. I'm tired, Jesus. I'd go, but I'm tired. Lord, I'd go and do, but you know, Lord, I got so much other stuff to do. And what happened to the disciples is what happens to us if we're not careful. That small window of opportunity closes. And they never got that opportunity again. Never in the history of the world would that ever would that opportunity ever be there. You see what the thing I would say to you this morning, church, is as as we're watching these folks go through the baptismal waters, the thing I would say to you is the thing that the church in Mastodo heard me say: make sure you take advantage of, of this and make sure that you're here and, and celebrating this, because this may not always be the case in the life of the church. And I'm sure that you've been through dry periods where you didn't, the baptismal waters didn't stir. And sometimes when they stir a whole lot, you know, things get to swirling in the back of our heads. Whether well, they really know what they're doing and are they really, are they really going to stay in church and all that. Well, that's God's business. Let Him worry about all that. But appreciate what God's doing because this is a window of opportunity that God's given me and He's God's given you to be a part of what the work of the kingdom is. When you put off doing things, what procrastination is, if you're writing down stuff, write this down. Procrastination is a thief of your time. It's a thief of time. Some of you all right now are working in jobs you absolutely hate. And you'd like to do something else, but you don't know what to do. And so another day goes by, another day goes by, another day goes by, and, and you know your, your time is just running out. I know nobody in here is, uh, I know everybody in here is more spiritual than I am, but there was a soap opera on I used to watch back in the day. Yeah. Don't watch it anymore, it's gone crazy. But it, but it began to open, the opening was like sands through the hourglass. <laughs> oh, so y'all watch them too, huh? Ah, you bunch of sinners. Man, 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 man. I quit watching it after uh, after the woman, uh, what, uh, the blonde-headed woman. Yeah, after she got demon possessed or something and went all crazy, I quit. It got too off the deep end for me. I quit watching it. <laughs> then they took my show off the air called uh, uh, "As the World Turns." That was my show. They took it off the air. But like sands through the hourglass, your time's ticking by, folks. You realize that you'll never get this day back again. No matter how many times we gather in this room, we'll never get this particular circumstances and situation happen to us again. Where everybody's wearing the color shirts and shoes and shorts and pants and whatever it is that you're wearing. Where everybody's sitting in a particular place. We'll never get this moment again. And what procrastination does says, well, I'll do it later. But what if later never comes? Because that's what happened to these disciples. Jesus the third time goes back and says, Look, it's over. Time's up. we got to go. I'm getting ready to go in Jerusalem. I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to be buried. I'm getting ready to rise from the dead. And I'm getting ready to leave here. The time that you had that you could have spent with me is over. Now how many of us know it's true when you think about, you know, maybe you're in the age now that your kids are grown up and you look back and you say, You know what? 
I wasted away some of that time. I worked too much or I wasn't at home enough. And you look back now and your kids are grown and you say, you know what? I wish I could go back and do some stuff. And maybe sometimes, maybe that's why grandparents, I think, sometimes overcompensate because they, you know, we're so busy. And I understand that. Look, I'm as busy as anybody in the room. Uh, if you need me to know something that, you know, that I really need to know, write it down somewhere for me so I can put it in a calendar somewhere. Because if you expect me to remember, I got too much going on. I got kids running 50 miles an hour every which direction. I got work. I got church. I got, it's just crazy. I understand that. But procrastination steals your time. And they lost out on their opportunity to, to spend it with Jesus. It also robs you of your opportunity to serve. I was thinking when Mr. Hunt got baptized this morning, I was thinking about the girl, Pam and, and, and Patty. Y'all remember, uh, right off the top of my head, I can't remember her name. Yeah. Missy. Her name was Missy. She was 38 years old. She had breast cancer. She was dying. She said she never had been baptized, and that really bothered her. For whatever reason, I don't know if people didn't want to bother her or what, or didn't be bothered with her or what, but I don't know what the deal was. But somebody called me and said, Look, this girl's dying. She's a Christian, but she's never been baptized. Can we do something? I said, Sure, I'll help her. So we talked with her, and she came to church, and and um, and uh, she made a public profession. And a couple weeks later, she come back to be baptized. And it was much steeper to get up there than it is here. But she literally, I watched her crawl on her hands and knees, one step at a time, because she was in so much pain that nobody could hold on to her to take her up the steps or pack her up the steps. She had to literally crawl, crawl one step at a time, and we baptized her. And one of the things I remember her saying is, I wish I had done this sooner. If you're waiting for some magical place to, to you get an opportunity, you know, that you're going to get some place that everything's perfect and then you'll serve God, you're not, never going to get there. Your life is always going to be hectic. It's always going to be busy. Your life is always going to have challenges in it. Your life is always going to have issues in it. You're, and then what happens is you get older and the things that you used to be able to do, you're not able to do anymore. And then the next thing you know, you've missed out on the opportunity to serve. I would challenge you today, to what, serving God means you're making God priority. You're carving out time in your life to say, you know what, this is important. Everything else is important as well, but this is the most important. And so I will carve out of my day or out of my schedule the opportunity to do what I'm supposed to be doing, and that's serving God. Procrastination robs you of that. Well, I'll do it, you know, the, the young guy says, well, I'll do it when I, when I uh, graduate college. And then the guy graduates college and he starts a family and he says, well, then I'll, I'll serve the Lord and do stuff when my kids get grown. Then the kids get grown and grandkids come along. Well, I'll serve the Lord when I, when I retire. And then you retire and the reality is is that every person to a T that I have ever talked to who's retired tells me the same thing. I am busier now in retirement than I was when I was working full time. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's true. Unless you carve out that time and say, you know what, serving God is a priority for me and my family, and this is what we're going to do, you're going to wake up one day and your whole life has passed you, and you haven't been able to do anything for the kingdom because you were waiting to some magical, magical place. Luke chapter 9, verse 59. Let me read this to you for the sake of time. It says, And Jesus said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but thou go and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61 says, And also, another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go home and bid farewell to those that are at my house. And Jesus said, that No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now what these guys were doing were saying, Lord, we want to serve you, but i got to take care of some other stuff first. Now what Jesus wasn't doing was telling this guy, disregard your dead dad, you know, disregard him. No, what he was saying is, look, unless you make it a priority to put me first, you're always going to have an excuse. Let's think about coming to church on Sunday morning. 
you run into people and the oh boy, I'd like to have been there, but everybody knows that going to church is a habit. And when you get out of the habit of going to church, somebody tell me that's done this and got out of going in the habit, how hard is it to get back into the habit of going? It's very hard. It's very hard to get back into that habit of going once you've gotten out of the rhythm of doing it. But it's a, it's a matter of priority. Okay, look, here's what we're going to do. I could do a lot of things today, but I'm making it a priority that for me and my family, we're going to go to church. That's, that's just setting priorities in your life. And we're going to do this, whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether the preacher preaches till 1245, or we get out at 1030. This is my priority. Jesus comes first in this area. How about, how about when we try to go sit at home, study the Bible, or do something like that? Things start getting in the way, right? It's a matter of setting, setting those priorities and saying, look, this has to be first. So why does this have to be first? Well, look, if you're a believer, you're trying to live like Jesus. And maybe the reason why so many of us see hypocrites all around who preach one thing and live another is because they haven't set the priority to spend the time with the Father like we're supposed to. Maybe when they were supposed to be praying with Jesus, they were sleeping like the disciples. And the opportunity passed them by. The final thing I would say, and I'll get out of your way this morning, is that procrastination causes regret. One well, of these days you're going to look back and say, boy, I wish I'd have done some of this stuff. You don't live, look, if I could challenge you in anything, don't live your life with regret. Live every day to the maximum on purpose. Don't live with re regret. That you didn't tell somebody that you loved them that you didn't go tell somebody that you care. You know, one of the biggest things in my ministry, and this has happened so many times, is I'll be standing at a casket with a family after everybody else has come through the line. And they've gone out. You know how they do at the funeral home. You go out and you wait for the, for the family to do the final viewing, and then they bring the casket out to the hearse. I've, I stay behind. That's part of my job. I have to walk the casket out to the, to the hearse, and I stay behind, behind with the family. And you don't know how many times I've stood at the head of a casket with a family and heard somebody say, you know, I never heard my dad tell me they, he loved me. I never heard my dad tell me he was proud of me. Not just, you know, he. Girls tell me that I've heard that same thing too. Or, you know, we never, we never got to do this together. We never got to do that together. We never done this. We never done that. Because there was always what? Tomorrow. And one day, you wake up to find that tomorrow doesn't come. Or what I call waking up dead. You ever wake up dead? So it's a magnificent thing. You, just, you know, I, I use that every now and then to call in, uh, call in sick to work. Instead of calling in sick, I call in dead. I woke up dead this morning. I won't be here. <laughs> just went right over y'all's head. <laughs> One of these days, you're going to wake up dead. No more tomorrows. No more opportunity. No more second chances. So let's say this. If tomorrow you wake up dead. See, it sounds funny when I say wake up dead, but the reality is you're going to wake up dead. And you're going to wake up in one or two places, heaven or hell. You will wake up dead. <laughs> well, let's say tomorrow you wake up dead. Where will you find yourself? Heaven? Hell? That all, that all determined about by what you do with Jesus. But let's say tomorrow you wake up dead and you know Jesus and you wake up and you're in heaven and, and everything's great. Let me ask you this question, and I want you to think about this seriously. Everything for you will be great if you wake up dead and find yourself in heaven. But what about the people that you leave behind? Will it be good for them? Did you say everything that you needed to say? Did you do everything that you needed to do? Did you tell your, your children that you loved them and you were proud of them? Or 
or were, did you take that trip together to spend some time or were you just too busy because you know after all we got to work and pay bills I'd be willing to bet you there's some people there's probably some somebody in this room who hadn't taken a vacation in probably years maybe because you're too tight I don't you know maybe that may be it or two maybe just, just there's an excuse that you know what I don't have time and, and, and the, little, the little kids are, are little, and then one day they're going to grow up, and they're out of the house, and you're, man, I wish I'd have done this, and I wish I'd have done that. You know, the great thing about, the, the, about worrying about the bill man is that he'll always be there. And if you take vacation, he'll be there when you get back. What matters is, is what we're doing now. See, some of y'all could be serving the church, but you're waiting to some magical place. It's never going to come. You have to make the decision that now's a priority, that my life is going to be lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here today and you've grown cold in your walk and your relationship with God. Maybe you need to make a priority to get back and doing the things that you used to do when you really were in love with Jesus, studying your Bible, praying, serving other people. Because tomorrow, folks, may not ever come. You know, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the song Garth Brooks sung a few years ago, If Tomorrow Never Comes. Really a lot of truth to that. Would, would everybody, would, would the people that are important in your life really know how much you love them? Don't let putting off till tomorrow rob you of your time. Because tomorrow may not come. Let's stand our feet.